Over on PureFlix, aka the Christian Netflix streaming service, the original series Hitting the Brakes is an unoriginal sitcom about a former race car driver who moves his family to a small town full of colorful characters. By that I mean they dress funny and have accents. There are no actual people of color in the cast. The producers in charge at PureFlix really said, for we have seen the face of God and it is white and dusty. Now bringeth us the actors who looketh like mozzarella. Like many of the shows on this platform, Hitting the Brakes stars its co creator David A.R. White, who is also one of the founders of PureFlix itself. Someone whose dedication to God is matched only by his commitment to the same hairstyle since 2005. As the third PureFlix sitcom that we've looked at together, I'm starting to notice some interesting patterns in the writing and production of this wholesome family programming. So join me for more negative gender stereotypes, cliche characters from the discount bin of more successful shows, and an impressive list of celebrity guest stars that prove sometimes the greatest miracle is just getting that paycheck. And another blessed installment of Clip Breakdown! <laughs> Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown, baby. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other stuff like shows and whatever. And we focus on each one just like a prayer to decide if it's godly or goodly or badly or dodly. And today we're back at it again with another Pure Flix episode. Um, Mama, this one is just as fun as the others. We had Meet the Beverlies, which was like Hannah Montana. Montana. We had the sitcom about the TV show. I guess that was kind of like 30 Rock. And if anything, this one is like more along the lines of those man of the house sitcoms like Last Man Standing or King of Queens. But then there's also this element of like Shit's Creek, which was very popular around the time this show was made. So it makes sense. Pure Flix seems to be the queen of deriving their shows from better stuff. But before we get into it, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more Pure Flix quick clip breakdowns like this. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. So turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know. That's how you join the Nick D crew. Or as some people are saying, d Rama Club, which I think is so fun. But anyway, let's get into the bid. a -ching Oh, also I've got merch available and um, a Patreon where you can access exclusive clip breakdowns and watch parties and such. As usual, these Pure Flix sitcoms do not do any sort of foreplay. They go in dry. Prison lube right up my ass with these plot lines. What is it with men? They talk about us women being shopaholics, but they go on and buy all sorts of useless, impractical junk. Where is an eight-year-old getting the data to make such a sweeping generalization? The only men and women you know are your parents, and they think the Bible actually happened. Maybe your household is confined to those outdated gender roles? But my parents saw actual therapists instead of just seeking marriage counseling from Pastor Dave, who's never had a date. Also, do you guys like how I learned how to say the word pastor correctly? I used to say pasture. Pastor. Pasteurized cheese. With these talking heads where the girls are sitting on the couch, it's very modern family as well. They use this interview mockumentary style device that's never really justified throughout. Useless impractical junk. Stuff they can't even wear or put on their hair. Useless. I'm sorry to interrupt. You're telling me this is the head of a man with no product in his hair? Where is all this PC texture coming from? God himself? He just decided to bless you with strands that are naturally crisp. Okay. Anyway, tell me more about how you're an expert on women since you married the first one willing to f you. Women have no eye for valuable future collectibles, like this dinosaur. <laughs> made from recycled. That's right, I said recycled because I care about the planet. Toothbrush. Mama, this thing is dripping with more hot glue than the front bumper of my Prius. I'm about to take away the prop department's midnight mass privileges if they're gonna be getting their work done last minute like this. Unprofesh. Do you think Jesus would put something on camera that looks covered in pre-cum? No, he was a professional carpenter, hunty. He said, what do you want, a little rocking horse? A couple bookends? I do floors, but you gotta love splinters. The theme songs are typically the best part of on any pure Netflix show because they're like, let's just tell the whole pilot episode in a song. Imagine making the car crash that almost killed you a part of your theme song. My family almost saw me die. They didn't think that I'd pull through. I had to breathe through a two. Like, okay, <laughs> Brian Adams, Diane Adams, more like. Living in a hotel. 
Although they're setting up basically the same premise as The Shining, the tone makes me feel like more of these characters are gonna survive. Also, if any of you have any Groupons for brain surgery, I'm trying to remove the part that spends 24 hours a day singing, we're living in a hotel. We're living in a hotel. We know by now. We're living in a hotel. Okay. This episode is basically about how the main guy, what's his name? Randy, I want to say. Randy, yep. Always buys useless junk at the store, the town store, which is run by some folksy towns people. One thing I'll say to the show's credit is they do kind of sell each character really well up front. Like, you know who each of these characters are supposed to be, but they're all just too similar, particularly the female characters. They don't have enough differentiation and they kind of suck. Okay, so you're saying that I've never gone over there and picked up the odd, super low priced piece of way worth it, not to mention rare. It almost feels kind of cruel to watch this cast stumble so awkwardly through their comedic timing. It's almost like if you put roller skates on a baby cow. It's kind of cute, kind of funny, but either way, it's next stop slaughterhouse. You can't get the sad smell out of the air. But at least I never bought a coffin. Perhaps you should. And maybe we can bury all of these eyesores you keep dragging home. Huh? Imagine if your sole purpose in life was to be a nagging wife to your father. These characters read about harpies and said, we'll be that, but without the feathers. Also, how come when we go to the older daughter's close up, it feels like she's looking directly into my soul. The eyelines get all off. Also, I just want to say, I worked on a lot of sets where the character is for some reason, like a little bit, ooh, a little bit sarcastic. And the actress always wants to put on a thick line of liquid liner as though she's like, my character would have a cat eye. It's like, if you say so, but I think it's kind of like putting yourself into a little bit of a corner. If you're saying like your character's whole personality is based on the fact that they do bold liner, it doesn't look that good either is what I'm saying, especially not without a false lash. That's a problem I'm gonna have several times throughout this episode, just to give you a gay heads up. A gay heads up, watch your gay head duck down. All right, let's go back to Stuff on the Bluff, which is the country store thing. Hey, tell us. Hey, 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 hey. Now remember what you promised, Dad. You're going to buy a screwdriver, not a screwdriver and a coffee table made of barber chair footrests. Why are they playing a laugh track just for the phrase coffee table made of barber chair footrests? These aren't jokes. This is just a bunch of random family friendly words being said by a little girl who we already told needs to project. All it does is remind me that this show concept is completely derivative of other shows that in themselves were already tired. Or another Swiss army lacrosse stick. Hey, that's not useless. He's planning to annihilate the family with that. So I would maybe start being a normal kid and stop all acting like you're the white mom for Modern Family. I would snap so quickly in this household. Anyway, we can't get through a scene without these interrupting things, but I don't, I don't understand these talking heads like where they actually come up in the story. At the end of the day, in the middle of the day, in the middle of conversations. It's not based in reality. So you're not even gonna try to sell me the coffin? No, such a purchase would be premature for a man such as yourself in obvious good health. Why does every actor in this talk like it's Shakespeare in the park? The writer said, would these characters have normal sounding dialogue or would they talk like an old timey shopkeeper for some reason? Why do they want every character to come off like it's your dad who auditioned for a school play? <laughs> wow. Dad has been in Stuff on the Bluff for a minute and a half, and he hasn't bought anything useless and dumb. How would you know? Are you watching him in your magic cauldron or something? And do you see my problem? Like how, what do they know about what he's doing at this store and what he's bought so far? Do these talking heads take place outside the space and time of the actual plot? Because time travel has never sounded natural to me ever since my minister died after watching an episode of Doctor Who. Randy promised that he wouldn't purchase anything but the screwdriver. I guess the only question is, how is dad going to get lumbered with useless ugly stuff from Manny and not break his promise? Yeah, I think that's what we're all wondering here at the six minute mark, Red. Thanks for the update. I don't think this plot line requires this many reminders. Straight up, nothing has happened yet. And they're like, before we join a story already in progress, let us lay out the scene. Like we know mama, your dad bleaches his hair and buys a bunch of bullshit. We've been through this. Do you guys want to hear the little girl talk again? Of course. I sense a hitherto unforeseen loophole. Sweetheart, I promise you the high SAT scores will not be worth everyone in your class hating you for four years. My hips are sore just watching the three of them with their crossed legs. They're like, we're all sitting on a bag of marbles. Mm. Meanwhile, at the store, the gang of gangies are telling him he's gonna do buy this. <laughs> You're trying to sell me a folk singer? Nah, no, nothing so banjo and ukulele. Uh, Rupert here, he does a Roy Orbison tribute act. He's performed before all the crowned heads of Europe. 
Actually, he once said that he got arrested for doing his act in front of a Burger King. Same thing. I hope you laughed at that, because that was objectively the most successful joke in the whole episode. And if you didn't laugh, then you can just keep being bitchy with me. Come on, it's fun. It keeps all the dark thoughts away. The way they get into this is the guy is like, oh, we have this amazing musician, but I don't have the place to have him play. If only someone with a hotel could host him. And I'm just like, why do these guys at the shop store even want to get this random Roy Orbison singer a job? Like, why is it in their interest to make him have a job? They're like, well, if we don't hire him, then he's gonna be living out in the forest. It's like, but how do you even know this guy? What, why do you care? I'm not saying it can't just be out of the goodness of their heart, but that needs to be made clear at least. Is he like a super do-goody guy or just some crazy guy who keeps selling junk? We don't understand it. It would take zero effort to put a line in to give us that motivation. Zero effort. And they were like, zero effort, can do. You know, if this were one of them hokey sitcoms, there'd be a flip right about now. I swear an actor says there's no possible way on earth or beyond he's gonna do something. And then the, the screen flips and he's doing exactly that. It's pretty standard TV comedy trope. Well, it's good to see the writing team is at least aware that TV tropes exist since every storyline they produce is just a constellation of tired cliches. That's like me saying I'm aware of what bears are when I'm already covered in bear entrails and wearing a bear hide as a skin suit. Like at this point, you better know what it is because you've made a bloody mess. Also, does that guy with the high pitched voice remind anyone else of James A. Janice from The Kill Count? That's all I can think when I watch him. Tag him, let him know. We are lucky that this isn't some sort of hokey sitcom because there is no possible way on earth that I am taking this guy back with me. <laughs> Okay. With all of the previous explanation about this trope, the runway for landing this joke was about a mile wide, yet we're still somehow out here searching the wreckage for survivors. Like, how did you devote so much comedic buildup to this thing, and then that's when you gave the laugh track guy his lunch break? Watching a pure flick show without the invasive laugh track is like seeing Jesus without his little diaper thing. It needs to be there, or the whole congregation is gonna be very uncomfortable. More bad jokes ruined by bad editing and horrible pacing and bad execution. Like. Let's fix it. Come, let's come. Come, children. Gather around, apostles. You're not gonna get in trouble doing this, are you? The real trouble is that they clearly only have one shade of makeup for every man on this set. It's a yellowish beige color called Jesus Approved White Guy. And if they can't make it work for an actor's skin tone, the casting department knows they're too ethnic for a lead role. So it's killing two birds with one stone, which sounds biblical in itself, doesn't it? Killing birds, smashing things with stones. If I lived in the Bible days, that would be the best part, is like attending a stoning and being like, yes, Take that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I would never stone someone. I would be Jesus if I was in the Bible days, I think. I'm the man of the house. I don't get into trouble. Randy, is that you? So what sort of trouble are you in today? So we're 0 for 2 when it comes to properly executing one of those smash cuts that we think are so funny. It's sad to see their own editing and overwriting get in the way of the jokes that I see them trying to make. But it's just like that old saying, the Lord giveth, the Lord ribbit ribbit. Anyway, here's how that scene should have gone. I'm the man of the house. I don't get into trouble. So what sort of trouble are you in today? See, just by removing that wife's little bit of dialogue and speeding up the transition, the joke now feels stronger and more intentional to me. Don't give up on yourself, Pure Flix. God has a plan for you. And it's not just to be playing on TV while people over the age of 70 pass away. If you work hard, you can create real laughter, just like those recorded sound effects you play. Oh, blessed be the Lord. As usual, it seems like the team at Pure Flix could stand to brush up on their writing skills a little bit. Maybe they could benefit from the free trial membership at Skillshare. The sponsor of today's video. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative and curious people. Whether you're looking to gain valuable new skills, explore your passions, or just get into that creative flow that I love so much. Skillshare has been an amazing resource for my work with impressive songwriting and filmmaking courses, but I've also been really into the lifestyle topics where we can learn things like productivity or therapeutic arts and crafts. In fact, this month I've been exploring productivity for creatives, build a system, that brings out your best. Taught by Thomas Frank, who is another busy YouTuber just like me. Skillshare provides focused, ad-free learning that lets you follow your inspiration. And with an annual subscription, it's less than $10 a month. Plus, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to use the link in my description will get a free trial premium membership so you can explore your creativity. So go ahead and use that link and get started on Skillshare. Now, let's get back to hitting the brakes. Now we're at Sky's View Vegan Restaurant. This is the vegan restaurant 
restaurant run by Skye, who is the vegan girl of the place. <laughs> she definitely reminds me of the innkeeper character from Schitt's Creek, where she's supposed to be a little bit deadpan, but super funny. Um, she's not nearly as charming or charismatic as the actress in Schitt's Creek who does it. I've only seen like uh, four episodes of that show, so forgive me for not knowing all the cast's name and all of that. You can let me know what all their names in the comment, the name of the character I'm thinking of. Also, any other shows that you see them borrowing from, I would love to hear in the comments below because I don't watch a lot of sitcoms. I'm not gonna catch all of them. What makes you think I'm in trouble? It's the middle of the day and you don't have your wife or children with you to hear whatever it is that you did that you weren't supposed to. That sentence was confusing, Schmoronica. She said, the main thing I want people to know about me as an actor is that I always apply my own eyeliner. Whatever you say, sweetheart, but I promise you that felt tip pen is only holding you back. That thick line with no lash is putting me right back in first period of ninth grade when everyone looked like cartoon ghosts. It was that time when you're a teenager when you've learned about foundation, you've learned about eyeliner, you've learned about mascara. What's blush? What's bronzer? We don't know. What's lipstick? In the early thousands, girls were putting concealer on their lips. That's how washed out and cray we all look. Meanwhile, I was wearing flared jeans with flip-flops to school. Imagine having your toes out at public school. Oh, my toes especially. They look like megalodon feet. Okay, so here we have Rob Schneider about to go on for his first performance. We surprisingly have a lot more to talk about in this show. My one-man show is entitled Orbison Sings the 90s. The 1890s. Yeah, I sing songs like Bury me not in the Lone Prairie. Why am I watching Rob Schneider doing Michael Keaton as Beetlejuice? I don't know what weird set of dice we rolled to get that combination, but I wanna go again. Yeah, at the concert, we get a stronger sense of the funny people of the town through the eyes of these out-of-towners who are like, what's going on here? It's got some old gunk in the speaker part there. Sort of looks like chip dip. <laughs> Has a taste. A little brassy, but not inedible. Oh, I forgot to ask, why the f are you wearing a bunny suit? It's like if Donnie Darko something, something, something. I fell asleep during that movie. Also, what kind of gross stuff is this? I hate Pure Flix for their squishy sound effects. Oh. Ew, why did he eat it like that? Why do we white people have to be such freaky little weirdos? Too many of us come out looking like the human species version of Rizzo the Rat from the Muppets. My little bumblebee, be my little baby bumblebee boo. I don't know enough about Roy Orbison to understand why this is a bad tribute act. I guess because I wasn't sock hopping down to the record shop in 1963. They didn't want to pick a slightly more recognizable musician for him to be impersonating. Seems like this could have easily been Elvis. Just make it a little bit more broad for the audience, but whatever. Also, could have easily been Elvis is the title of my forthcoming children's book. It's about a dog named Elvis who often gets blamed for mischief around the house. Patent pending, copyright 2021, no child left behind. Those are all official contracts when I clap. When I do a gay clap, that's legal. That's a legal notary. Stamped. I always clap like I have acrylic nails on. Do you notice that? I'm like, ladies, gentlemen, countrymen, listen to me. I do the same when I'm on my phone. I'm always like, hold on, let me just check my bank account. Like, girl. Want me to clear a space in the lounge for all the congratulatory flowers that will be arriving? No, I want you to clear a space for yourself in the evangelical television industry. This is not the first show we've seen on Pure Flix where the only Latino or non-white characters are servants or maids. And I got one question for you. What the f Father John. We can't get an old white guy to cut this rich family's fruit like Alfred from Batman? Oh no, all those guys get the youth ministry jobs where they're paid to touch children. I didn't make it happen. I'm just talking about it, okay? Mwah. Here's some resources for victims of abuse, especially within the Christian environment. So basically everyone hates the performance. You can only really tell this by their reaction shots and the laugh track. The music itself, it sounds the same as when he's performing well later on, so I don't know. I won't be holding you to your contract. We made a deal. And I wouldn't be the person I profess to be if I reneged on it. I'm gonna go ahead and recommend that you find another word for going back on your promise. Oh, by the way, I think this woman who plays Larry's Alfred White, what's his name? Pat, pa the guy's wife is his ex-wife, real life wife. Not longer married anymore. I can't talk. Oh, oh. It's a great little song. 
Who wrote that? Uh, nobody, because I didn't really say any actual words. He's just out there openly wailing, and she's like, hey, that's a fun little ditty. Even though he was just convinced to stay, he now has to be convinced to stay again. I'm running scared out of town. I thought you're supposed to stay and perform until the end of the month. And I thought we just had this conversation with another character a few minutes ago. This whole episode is just Rob Schneider singing twice with three scenes of people convincing him to stay in between. World's driest sandwich coming up. But don't worry, Pure Flix always loses lubes things up with some godly gravy right at the end when it no longer matters to the story. So Sky convinces the town to show up for his third act since no one showed up to the one in between and it made him depressed. And then he finally does the number. Before he was nervous about actually performing as himself and not as Roy Orbison. So Sky kind of tricks him a little bit into kicking him in the pants to doing the performance and holding up his work. Because the guy, the race car driver, is such a nice guy. is supposed to be the thing. I don't like it. I'm bored. It was never really clear to me that the race car driver was doing this amazing deed by keeping the guy hired for a month. A month seems like a long time too. Whatever. Let's just watch. I'm finished. I'm finished. I'm finished. You better be, sweetheart. This sounds, again, exactly like when it was supposed to be bad music earlier, so I'm a little confused. The only difference is that now the laugh track is gone and people are giving pleasant reaction shots. Not me though, here's my reaction shot. I'm finished, I'm finished, I'm finished. I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. What is that guy supposed to be talking about? He's like, oh yeah, he's singing up there. He's like, I'm done, I'm done. Stop, you are done. So the next day, everyone's like, wow, he's actually a really talented songwriter. We're gonna have a sold out run for the whole month, but not so fast, because we only got him for one episode, baby. He just skipped out on you. What? what? Yes, by now it's obvious to both of us that my burgeoning career has outgrown your quaint little hotel. Right, because the music industry is always looking for the hottest new 50 year old who can play a few chords on the guitar. Best of luck to you out there on your music career. I'm sure you'll make an excellent substitute teacher. Just a fun little button at the end here. Uh, now, what's his name? David's character has to find a substitute. Hey, so I heard you might be in need of a tribute act. Oh, yeah. I do a pretty good carrot top. I'm sorry, but I, I, I don't see any resemblance at all. <laughs> You're kidding, I hope. I love Carrot Top pulling back his hair to show more of his face. Like, baby, that's the least recognizable part of you at this point. All I remember you from these days is agreeing to be on this TV show with those roots. Lucia Ball, what? I'll buy my own dress. That's weird. Yeah, men wearing dresses is weird, but creating and starring in three awful sitcoms, playing the same character just so you can profit off of other Christians is so normal and cool. Oh, did you guys know that Burt Reynolds is in this show? I thought this was interesting at first, till I read on David A.R. White's Wikipedia page that one of his first gigs as an actor at age 18 or 19 was playing a character who was the friend of Burt Reynolds' character's son in a sitcom that ran for four years on CBS. So when Burt Reynolds appears in this show, he's actually only doing it as a voiceover as a David's dead dad. Love that. After 20 years, I finally shaved off my beard. I said I grew it to hide my poker face, but the truth is, it was a mask. I thought people wouldn't like me if they could see who I really was. Well, there were an awful lot of syphilis scars under that beard, so you were probably right. Next, Burt Reynolds goes into this like waxing poetic moment about all of the good peoples of the towns. He wears a lot of hats, but he wears each one with pride. Guy's the toughest person I ever met, but also completely unafraid to let anyone see her big heart. Manny, I think he's only in business to amuse himself. But in so doing, he amuses us too. These characters are the biggest oddballs you ever met. Yeah, and I hate all of them too. What's your point, disembodied voice? I wasn't proud of my past, but God gave me the chance and the strength to start again. All my love, Dad. Burt Reynolds said, in addition to using my voiceover at the end of every episode, I will also give you access to several weird publicity photos that you can use to make it look like I had anything to do with this production. Good night. Do you see how they always cram in the religious stuff at the very end of these shows where it's always someone like reading from a book and being like, and this is how it relates to the Lord. Nice. I don't think they do enough to weave that messaging or that churchiness into the entire episode. And it wouldn't be too hard to do, like just include some religious figures in it. I mean, unless 
that's not the point. I guess they don't want to be too heavy handed with it. But for me, it just feels like an afterthought. So I could use a little bit more of that inclusion or connection throughout. But let me know what you guys think of our third look at the Pure Flix sitcoms of yore. I would love to hear your opinions. Also, give this video a big thumbs up if you want to dive into more Pure Flix content. And most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, so turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when I'm sending it from the heavens. I'm trying to hit 200,000 subscribers this year, so it would mean so much to me to have you on board with the Nick D Rama Club. Also, I have a more more each available and a Patreon where you can access monthly bonus episodes and exclusive watch parties and more. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you for getting holy holier than thou with me today. I will see you next time.